Julien Fouju es uno de los creadores del videojuego Angry Birds, una aplicación que ha alcanzado millones de descargas en todo el mundo. Este emprendedor, quien se autodefine como un constructor de productos sorprendentes, ha desempeñado un papel clave en importantes firmas. En Scarlet Motors, una compañía fundada por él, reunió y condujo un equipo en pos de desarrollar un automóvil deportivo de vanguardia. Además, fue creativo en Robio Entertainment, la firma responsable de Angry Birds. Julien cursó un doctorado en micro y nanotecnologías en la Universidad de Tecnología de Tampere, en Finlandia. También dicta conferencias sobre manejo de grupos, además de haberse desempeñado como representante de marcas y productos en ferias comerciales. En 2013, ofreció dos conferencias en UNIAC, las que fueron transmitidas por videoconferencia para toda la comunidad académica de la institución. Bienvenidos a Universidad UNIAC. En esta ocasión estamos con un invitado de lujo, Julien Forgeau. Él es uno de los creadores del juego Angry Birds, el que todos ustedes podrán conocer y que es uno de los más vendidos en el mundo de los videojuegos. Julien es una persona muy difícil de describir, por lo que vamos a pasar directamente a las preguntas. Julien, welcome to UNIAC. Thank you. Julien, in your website you describe yourself as catalyst and social and tech savvy French, mm -hmm. and passionate about building amazing products. So catalyst is because mm -hmm. of accelerating things. In, in chemistry, when you add a catalyst to a chemical reaction, you accelerate the reaction. And that's what I do with people, with team, with products. I will help accelerate things and make things happen faster. The um, digital native and, and social and tech savvy is around the fact that I, I come from a time where the computers were born and, and I've always learned how to stick to the digital age and, and build up the, um, let's say, my knowledge and my experience, expertise uh, with new technologies. Uh, social, because I like engaging with people, I like talking with people, I like sharing experiences, good ones and bad ones, mm. um, so that you know we can learn and, and develop ourselves. So you are you were born in France? In France? Yes, I am French. Well, half French and half Swiss. But you have you have studied in Finland? Yes. So I, I did most of my studies in Paris um, in an engineering school similar to UNIAC. Um, but based on uh, computer sciences, telecommunication mm -hmm. networks. And uh, for my last year of studies, I did uh, an Erasmus program in Finland, in Tampere. Uh, I was supposed to stay there only for three months, and mm -hmm. I ended up staying seven years. Mm -hmm. So now, you, you are you living in? So I went to London for two years um, mm -hmm. to work at the Simeon Foundation um, and created my own business, another business there. Um, but then I came back to Finland for Rovio, and um, I'm still living in Helsinki for the next couple of weeks, but I'm moving to the Silicon Valley um, in September. So, you have studied a PhD in, in micro and nanotechnologies? Yes, I have. Yes. Uh, how important do you think is to decide to learn for someone who is involved in the creative business? Well, it is really important. The more you know, the more you can widen your field of vision, um, the easier it gets to have innovative ideas and, and create new things. Uh, I mean, if you look at it, this is, this is my field of vision. I can still see my thumbs mm -hmm. right there, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people think really narrow and, and square, and it's good when you want to focus on something, if you want to specialize in something. But if you are creative, if you are a person who, who is supposed to understand really fast each and every business they're working for, uh, then it is best to learn as much as possible when you're at university. The other really good thing about university is that it's a safe environment. It's an environment in which you can make mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's not such a big deal. When you're in your career, it's a lot more challenging to make mistakes. So if you use university as a platform for learning, for developing your experiences, for meeting great people and building a network, then it's going to be a lot easier when you get to the professional life. In that sense, how important do you think is to, to know other cultures well, in terms of creation. So I think it is really important because it challenges you. It makes you think more. Um, I come from a really small village in the Alps, a uh, few thousand inhabitants in the mountains. Uh, I moved to Paris 
um, I, I didn't even believe that I could live in Paris. It was something for me that was mind-blowing. It was an amazing experience. But moving from a small village in the Alps to Paris was already a cultural shock, right? Same country though, same language. When I moved to Finland, it was a new country, new culture, and a new environment in which there were multiple cultures. And now that what I think has helped me in my career and in my life to be more tolerant, to understand people better, and also to take the best from each and every single cultures. As you can see, I speak a lot with my hands. This is something typical from Italians. Uh, French don't do that that much. Finns mm. never do that. Um, and then language has also been an important thing. Uh, when I moved to Finland, um, I still couldn't pronounce the H properly. So I would say, I ate you. Mm -hmm. It was not that I was angry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was angry. So it, then I, I worked on that and I, I got to the point that I could say, I hate you. And I was hungry instead of being angry and, and these kind of things. So it gives you a lot more perspective when you can interact with other cultures. And it makes you appreciate your own culture better, but also realize the limits of where you come from. And in, in that sense, in, in the creative process, how important do you think is, for instance, reading? Or reading and yeah. writing and... Yeah, well, I mean, that kind of thing. The, the, more, the more you read, uh, the more you have the possibility to understand things in a different perspective. Uh, watching videos, watching TV, that's great, uh, but you can't necessarily do that all the time. I remember that I used to read a research paper at the gym. So I would be cycling on the bike mm -hmm. and I would be reading a lot, um, any other places and so forth. But the, um, the big aspect of reading is that, in my case, it helped me learn English better. Um, but it's also what then makes it easier, for example, on Twitter, on Facebook, um, because I can express myself better. Um, I have a blog and, and it's a lot easier for me to write because I've read a lot and, and I know how to construct phrases and sentences and so forth. So English is not your first language? So not at all. How important do you think is to learn in English right now? Uh, I think it's key um, in the sense that we unfortunately don't have any other language that allows mm. us to, to communicate in the world, in the whole world. English has become the default language for that. Um, if Esperanto would have taken off, then mm. it would have been a great opportunity, uh, but unfortunately that's not the case. So French, for example, is a language that is spoken in, in a quite broad range of the world, right? There are different countries that have French as a second language, uh, some even as a first language in, in Quebec, for example, although it's the old traditional French. Um, but it, it's not enough. If, if I want to go to the US, if I want to go to South America, if I want to go to Japan, to Asia, um, French is not going to be enough. So I can try to, you know, to use a translator and, and a Google Translate and so forth to communicate in the native language, um, but it's a lot easier now to communicate in English. Of course, you can communicate everything mm. because, because it's not your mother tongue, it's not your first language. But I've been able to meet amazing people, do amazing things, visit great places and so forth, thanks to English. And, and even now in Chile, um, I've been surprised at how, man, how many people speak or at least understand English, which, which is something that even if you go to Spain, for example, is not mm. the case. Okay. So you said that you, uh, in the gym, you had the chance to read the uh, papers. Uh, yeah. So you are a very sportsman. Yes, what, I am. Um, well, it's, it's part of my history and, and lifestyle, so I, since I've been a kid, I've been doing sports. Um, I was lucky enough to live in the mountains and, and be able to ski, so I've been a downhill skier for, I don't know, 30 years almost. And uh, my father used to be an instructor, a ski instructor. So I, I got into skiing quite a lot, mm. and that, that's how my sports career started. Um, and then one day I realized that there was a, a racing club, a um, ski racing club in, in mm. my city, in my town. Um, so I asked my parents, like, hey, can I, can I compete? Can I race? And, and my dad was really happy, of course. He had not pushed me there, but he was really happy because he had done that when he was younger. So that's how I kind of got into racing, competing. Um, until, until I was 18, I had to move to Paris, and, and there skiing is a bit more mm. challenging. Um, so it, it has always been part of my life, uh, one way or another. 
But I was never really good in sports at school. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a surprising thing. Um, but now I've been kind of pushing myself, learning, developing uh, through sports and, and through some of the sports that I'm doing. And how did you become interested in base jumping? Well, that's a long story, mm -hmm. but let's make it short. Yeah. Uh, when I moved to Paris, I didn't have any sports anymore. I, I, yes, I, I was trying a bit of rock climbing, never re really good at running. Uh, roller skating was okay, but there was no sport that would allow me to push my boundaries and, and learn more about myself. And one day we got, uh, were at my parents' place with a friend during the holidays, watching TV, and uh, there was some skydiving on TV. Um, I don't remember, was it a movie? Was it an advertisement or mm. something? But we looked at each other and we're like, hey, that sounds cool. There's a drop zone like 20 minutes from here. We can just take the car and check it out. So we went there with my friend and we had a great time. We saw people jumping, the videos, like coming down with a huge smile. And when we drove back, my friend was like, you're not gonna do it. Like, well, you're not gonna do it either. So we mm. kind of pushed each other to the point that, well, let's do it. Let's go for it. Mm. And that's when I started skydiving, and that was back in 2000. 2000. So it was uh, 13 years ago. Um, I, I progressed quite fast in the skydiving, let's say, expertise, thanks to my previous uh, trainings and, and understanding of competition uh, with skiing. And at some point, I met people that were doing base jumping mm. and in Finland, and I started hanging out with them. We started talking. I started to learn packing and these kind of things. Um, up to the point that you know one thing leading to the other, I found myself on the edge of a bridge mm. in 2005, I think, and uh, made my first base jump. It's one of these sports that people call extreme, mm. but I call engaged, because you have to commit yourself. Mm. Um, I didn't go base jumping the first time like this. I spent three months training at the swimming pool, diving from the board. I was doing acrobatics. I was you know, reading a lot, I was watching a lot of videos, you know, preparing myself mm -hmm. mentally for that jump. And that's why when I did that jump, everything went fine. It just was, because it was the way I built it in my mm -hmm. head. So my body was ready and everything. It still was an amazing experience. Um, but within two days, I did five jumps, which mm -hmm. is quite a lot for our first jumps. Mm -hmm. So obviously, your, your other interest is technology. What can you, I, I think everybody's waiting for this question. What can you tell us about Angry Birds and how it all started? Well, Angry Birds was um, a pretty interesting story in the sense that the company had done already 52 games uh, or 51 games, that was the 52nd game. Uh, it was in a difficult situation in terms of financing. There were a lot of challenges in the mobile gaming industry at the time that was trying to take off, but had some like big question marks. Um, and the guys were, in a tight corner, so they had to find something, and they, they had decided that they would do a uh, kind of 10 project strategy, meaning that they would give a shot at 10 projects, and then if, if none of them would succeed, then they would just move on and do something else. And um, well, Angry Birds was the first one, and it started with just a character drawn on a, on a piece of paper, and, and that character, that bird looked angry, and nobody knew why. And that's how it started. It started by a character and people wondering like, why is this bird so angry? What makes him angry? And, and from that, you know, went on and, and then created a whole story around this. Um, it was also the right time because that's when the iPhone started to really kick in on the market. Mm -hmm. um, so the touch screen was something that was fairly new for customers. It was not new in the industry, but it was new for customers, especially the um, capacitive touch. Uh, which was a lot smoother than the resistive one. And, um, and combining these things, um, well, the team managed to uh, create a game that, that got people excited. But then it's not, I mean, I, I joined the company after the game was created, so I was part of the wave to really make it known worldwide mm. in, a, in a bigger manner. Um, but the, um, I would say that the, the smart approach there was that they tried to launch the game worldwide, and especially to the US, um, but it didn't work. Uh, because they were so small and insignificant at the time, nobody really cared about Rovio and, and that game. So what they did was then they went to smaller countries, um, I think it was uh, Denmark, um, Czech Republic, 
Finland, Sweden. Um, so the, these kind of small countries where Apple was really new and had a really small amount of customers, but where it was really easy to get in the top of you know, the charts. Mm -hmm. So by being number one in these few countries, then that's where Apple realized that, okay, hold on, these guys are number one there, what is this? And then they realized the power of the game and that it really was highlighting the capabilities of the phone at the time, and they featured them in the App Store in the US. And that's when everything started. Did you ever imagine it could become such a hit? At the time, the team didn't really you know, believe in them. They were like, okay, let's give it a shot. Let's mm -hmm. try. And, and as I say, if you don't try, you can't succeed. Yes. Uh, I, I, I have heard that in one of your presentations that you said it's very important to focus on people. Why? Yes. Because technology goes by. It evolves really fast and it changes really fast and people stay. So it's people that make technology, it's people that use technology, it's people that refactor technology. And the team is more important than the technology itself. Because ultimately you're gonna be spending eight hours a day minimum with people. Yes, some people spend eight hours a day with their computer, but if you're working in a team, then you're spending eight hours a day with a team and with people. So being able to First of all, understand that people are different and, and kind of capitalize on these differences um, is important, but also try to figure out what makes people tick, what makes them excited, what you know, makes them smile and, and have these sparkles in their eyes. And, and when you can do these things, then that's when you can build an amazing team of people that will push each other, that will move forward and grow. And if you fail at doing that, then you're gonna end up in a challenging situation where people will not be interested in working anymore. I mean, as a student, I've, I've seen that many times that you, ha you are forced by teachers to be in a group of three or four, and, and well, sometimes you're with a friend and then there's another guy that comes in who ends up doing the work, mm -hmm. the passionate ones, the ones that really are interested and that want to work together. And you always have this guy that just doesn't do anything, mm -hmm. right? And it's a normal thing as a student. You think that this is the way it goes, mm. but I disagree. I think it's, it's bad leadership in a way of not being able to work together and, and try to find why, why is this guy doing this? What is important for him or her? And, and that's, that's why I believe that people is the key. So you say that it's very important to delegate mm. jobs also. Well, yeah, I mean, one thing that I learned from my dad is that you can't do everything on your own. It's not possible. He has tried <laughs> and he has had challenges. It's a very usual that. mistake when, we're, when yeah. we, we are younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but even when you grow older, mm. it, it still can be a mistake. Mm. The, uh, my dad believes that you're never better satisfied than by yourself. So it means that if you give a job to somebody else, he's not going to do it as good as you could do it, which is true the first time. But the second time, he might do it better. And the third time, even better. And the fourth time, he will do it way better than you could even imagine doing it yourself. And the other thing is, when you delegate, when you give a chance for other people to succeed, then they will take that flame you know, forward without you. So they will then become independent. And that's when you grow the product, you'll grow the team, you'll grow everything. And then you can focus on what is really important, getting this team together and making things happen. I mean, when I was working at Scarlet Motors, uh, which was a startup that we launched with a friend of mine, um, building an electric sports car, the passion and the team was the most important. Because when you're building a startup, you have a limited amount of resource. Time and money are the ones that are the most limited. When people are passionate, when people are willing to you know, roll up their sleeves mm -hmm. and put their sweat into the project, then you, they will go the extra mile and they will carry the project even though time is really limited and money is almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. So what, what can you tell us about uh, Scarlet Motors, that, that car that you mentioned? Yeah, so we, um, it all started from a friend of mine, Yona, who um, had this dream of, of building a car at some point. And he got involved with the electric uh, car community in Finland called um, Sarkoauto, uh, which is the name in Finnish, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's this electric car now. 
um, movement that was planning to open source the uh, conversion of a regular car to an electric car. And that, that worked quite okay. They managed to uh, create that e-Corolla and, and some of the products. But because it was um, a community, self-organized, without necessarily any financing and so forth, um, it was really hard to keep up. So it was only based on the passion of people. So what my friend realized at the time, what Yona realized was that, well, the technology aspect wasn't that challenging. Yeah, of course there were challenges. But what really was missing from the electric vehicle business was the design aspect. Uh, why not making a car that looks good? So Yona started drawing and started to, to work with, with some of his friends on, on how this could be done. And that's when afterwards he asked me to join, to build a team, to lead the team, to bring the technical aspect, uh, bring the uh, startup and, and the um, kind of uh, some of the open source as well. Um, what we did different was that we uh, opened the development process to the community. So we started a, um, a platform uh, with a forum where people could come and exchange ideas and, and let's say provide technology, provide know-how. And ultimately with this we started to recruit some more people in the team. So we had a different approach, not in necessarily in the product itself, but the, uh, on how we were building the product. Uh, now the product itself is, is, is still quite sexy and, and it has a, uh, more uh, ideas around building an ecosystem rather than building just a car. Because you know, cars exist already, um, replacing the engine with an electric motor and batteries, okay, what's next? That's, that's innovative, mm. but it's only technology. What we are looking at is, is how to reinvent the way you drive, reinvent the way you connect with your car. Mm -hmm. So, technology is obviously very important. How important do you think is technology applied to education? Well, I think it, it's really important that education recognizes technology. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Um, meaning that for a long time, um, teachers have been repeating what they had been repeating for the past years. So, as a teacher, you would design your training, your course, and you would just give it for five years, ten years. Well, now you can't do that anymore because technology is evolving so fast, communication means are evolving so fast, that the world is now evolving a lot faster. So what is important is, first of all, to make good use of technology in, in your class, in your, in your um, let's say, teaching, um, in the materials that you're using and so forth, but it's also giving the opportunity for students to make good use of technology. Um, it's, it is now possible to do remote learning, for example. It is now possible to exchange with people on the other side of the globe. What and do you think, for instance, of the online education? Well, online education is quite important. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I believe it's not fit for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people that need to be in a classroom and, and need to have the, uh, the physical kind of aspect to it. Uh, but at the same time, there are people that are not necessarily able uh, to access this type of education because they live too far. Um, and I mean, if you think about Chile, it's such a long country that I believe the North people have never been to the South mm. and the South people never been to the North. They might have Most traveled the to, times, yes. yeah, they might have traveled to Santiago mm. for a holiday trip. Uh, but now, you know, the perspective of moving to Santiago to study uh, financially speaking, practically mm -hmm. speaking, all these kind of things might be a bit challenging. And they might also want to support the family business if they have, let's say, a farming business or these kind of, these kind of opportunities. So the online learning is an opportunity for them to transform their lives um, without, making, without taking too much risk or without making too much investment financially. And, and while still being able to support their family and, and so on, until they get to the point that they can really have a job that mm. takes them to the next stage. So Julian, what, this is your first time in Chile. It is. What, what can you tell us about your plans for South America? Well, I believe South America is um, in a really fast growing stage right now. Um, first of all, well, you're getting access to the internet uh, which is something that, that took a bit of time, but now is, is growing really rapidly. 
Um, I've, I've been told that 70% uh, of people in Chile have access to the internet, which is a pretty good penetration, uh, knowing that, that you're still a develop, in a way a developing country compared to, mm. um, to France, England and, and the US and so forth. Um, but what is really interesting is the fact that mobile is now taking a big leap and, and people are now starting to access the internet, access um, communication and, and apps and services through mobile um, more than they would do with their computer. And, and this, is, this is where South Americans are hungry. They want to learn, they want to develop, they want to grow. They're looking at, um, you know, Eric Schmidt, Zuckerberg, and all these guys, um, the big guys that, that have succeeded in, in California or in the rest of the world, and they want to do the same. That they are inspired by mm. these people. And, and this is something that is a massive difference compared to Europe, for example. Europe is, is rejecting the idols. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, these guys made a fortune, and yeah, yeah, yeah they were lucky, right? Mm. Whereas I believe in South America, people are like, well, let's work hard, and, and we want to be like these people. We are inspired by these people to, to push the boundaries. Mm. So, Julian, we're running, out, we're running out of time. So, what would, be, what would be your suggestion for people who are involved in the creative business, involved in the creation, in the technology? What can you say, what can you say to them? Well, I'd give two advices. One that my grandma gave me a while back, which is you know, travel as much as possible, because this is going to really build your character, build your awareness of the world. Um, and then the second thing is try to work on people. And, and even though you're doing a campaign, um, you're doing a new product or anything, just always keep in mind that you are dealing with people. And make sure that you bring them value, you support them in, in achieving their results. And even if they are just customers, you know, marketing as you know, we'll push you a brand so that you can buy it, is dead. Mm -hmm. Now it's all about engagement. It's all about how can, I, how can we help you to have a better life? How can we help you to succeed in the places that you haven't succeeded yet? Mm. Julien, thank you very much. Merci bien. Muchas gracias. And welcome again to Chile and to UNIAC. Thank you very much. De esta manera estamos terminando esta conversación, que esperamos les haya agradado. Y estamos dentro de poco en cualquier tipo de conversación tan interesante como esta. Muchas gracias.